Hello friends, I am Sanjay. In this series, I am covering the business study subject from the CBSE class 12 syllabus. We will be following the standard NCRT textbook for the topics that we will discuss. This is the sixth video in this series and we will cover the sixth chapter which is staffing. In the first part of the series, we discussed about the various functions of management. Planning is the first function where you decide at a high level what is to be done, how it is to be done and when it is to be done. You will set the goals and decide the strategy for the organization. To implement that plan or implement that strategy, you have to organize the resources that are required. So organizing includes allocating resources like time, money, people and deciding the team structures and assigning duties to the different roles or positions that you have created. Based on the roles and the team structure that you have finalized in the organizing stage, you will create job descriptions and hire or recruit the people in the next step, which is staffing. Staffing simply means finding the right people, either internally or externally, for the roles or the positions that you have created and also training the people to do the jobs. What is the definition of staffing? Staffing is the process of finding and bringing in the right people for the various roles in the organization. It is the process of obtaining, utilizing and maintaining a satisfactory and satisfied workforce. Staffing is not just about recruiting the required personnel, but also about keeping them within the organization. Because as we will discuss later in this part, losing experienced and trained employees may cause significant losses to the organization. Now, what are the different types of personnel that typically work in an organization? Depending on the type and size of the organization, there can be volunteers, interns, apprentices or trainees, casual workers, consultants, part-time employees, contract employees and full-time employees. So, recruitment is done for all of these different types of personnel. And as we will discuss later in this chapter, staffing is a process. It starts with estimating requirements and then recruitment, selection, placement and orientation, training and development, performance appraisal, promotion, career planning and compensation. Compensation means remuneration or the salary for the work that is done. Also, depending on the size of the organization, staffing is a continuous process. Due to ongoing increases or expansions in current roles, creation of new roles and refilling of vacancies due to resignations, staffing has to be done continuously. What is the importance of staffing? You can have the best plans or the best strategies for your organization, but you actually need people to implement those plans or strategies. So having the right people in the right roles at the right time is the key to the success of the organization. Staffing is the process of systematically filling the roles and the positions that are shown in the organization structure. In other words, staffing converts the plan in the organization structure into an actual workforce. Staffing helps you in finding and hiring qualified personnel for different jobs. It improves performance by placing the right persons in the right role. It ensures the company's long-term survival and growth through succession planning for managers because as uh, managers and even employees leave or uh, get promoted or retire, staffing is the process that is used to find replacements either internally or externally. Because staffing is done after uh, properly planning the requirements, staffing ensures optimal usage of human resources by preventing overstaffing and underutilization and thereby reducing labor costs. And it also helps in avoiding work-related disruptions by forecasting or predicting personal shortages in advance. And staffing also enhances job satisfaction and employee morale through objective assessments and fair rewards or compensation, which is the salary and benefits for their contributions. Staffing as a part of human resource management. If you look at the various resources that are typically used by an organization, there will be financial resources, physical, technology, information, natural and social resources, and also time, which is also a resource. To utilize and to manage all of these other resources, you need people, that is human resources. Managing human resources 
is nothing but human resource management now what are some of the important activities that are covered under human resource management analyzing jobs to create job descriptions recruiting qualified candidates developing compensation and incentive plans training and development for better performance and career growth managing labor and union relations handling employee grievances and complaints providing social security and employee welfare ensuring compliance with statutory and regulatory requirements and defending the company in lawsuits and avoiding legal issues now the first four points that is creating job descriptions recruiting people as per those job descriptions developing compensation and incentive plans and training and development are part of the staffing function so we can see that staffing itself is a part of human resource management let us take a quick look at the evolution of human resource management which is also the evolution of staffing human resource management which includes staffing is as old as civilization itself when uh, people started living in groups they had to identify the best people for different tasks and responsibilities which is nothing but one aspect of staffing when uh, people started performing organized activities like uh, farming or building large structures they needed people with different specialized skills and finding such people with specialized skills or training people for such skills is nothing but staffing but staffing as a scientific process and as a part of human resource management evolved into a specialized practice area during the industrial revolution this was when large scale factories were being established and labor unions and trade unions were formed the scientific management theories which we have already studied in the previous chapters focused on efficiency and systematic worker training the development of human relations as a speciality stressed on employee morale and social factors in productivity the evolution of labor laws made the human resource management to include legal compliance as well the development of organizational psychology led to the application of scientific methods in managing behavior and performance within the organization globalization and the growing importance of diversity required hr to manage cross cultural teams and global talent and all the technological advances like computerization led to the integration of automation and digital tools in hr also and the development of strategic human resource management led to the alignment of hr strategies with business goals and talent management and the growing importance of employee rights helped shaped hr policies on aspects like diversity equity inclusion and the recent importance that is being given to work life balance has led to human resource managers focusing on the well-being and mental health of employees as well and more recently like during the recent covid lockdowns the evolution of remote work forced hr to manage remote and flexible work arrangements as well to summarize if you want to write about the evolution of staffing and the various milestones in the development of staffing you can just write all the points from the evolution of human resource management next let us look at staffing as a process staffing is a process because there are a series of well defined steps and also because staffing is a cycle that never actually stops as long as the organization is active staffing will also continue staffing includes all the activities which are essential for creating an accurate job description for various roles ensuring that the right candidates apply for the jobs selecting the best candidates from among the pool of applicants onboarding the selected candidates into the organization ensuring that employees are compensated fairly for the work that they are doing and engaging with the employees and their managers to ensure retention there are eight important steps in the staffing process which are estimating the manpower requirements recruitment selection placement and orientation training and development performance appraisal promotion and career planning and compensation and we should also remember that external factors such as market conditions economic environment and competition influence the steps in the staffing process for example if there is a lot of competition in the market then the compensation or the salaries and benefits to be offered will need to get affected and the salaries and benefits that the organization is offering 
will in turn affect the recruitment process which involves ensuring that the right kind of candidates apply for the job next we will cover each of these different steps in the staffing process in a little more detail estimating the manpower requirements is the first step in the staffing process during the planning and the organizing stages you would have decided the overall process what needs to be done how it will be done and when it needs to be done to implement that plan or the strategy you decide how many people are required what should be their qualifications their skills their experience etc but uh, just putting all of these people into a room will not work people have to be managed so you will create an organization structure here you are estimating manpower requirements estimating manpower requirements involves understanding not just the number of employees needed but also the specific qualifications skills and experience required for various job positions here you are deciding the number of people required and the type of people required and the level of experience required to fill these different roles in the organization structure estimating manpower requirements involves workload analysis to determine the necessary human resources and workforce analysis to assess the available resources in other words you assess the work to be done to decide what kind of people and how many people you need and you assess your current employees to understand what you already have for example if you already have experienced employees you can promote them into the managerial roles rather than hiring managers from outside overstaffing and understaffing are both undesirable leading to either employee removal or productivity issues overstaffing means that you have more employees than required they are not fully utilized and you are wasting money understaffing means that you have less people than required which will affect productivity and it may also lead to employees being overworked and uh, they will burn out soon so you will need to estimate the requirements as accurately as possible to avoid overstaffing and understaffing the manpower requirements must be translated into specific job descriptions and profiles which form the basis for recruiting potential employees which means that based on the type of process and uh, the levels in the organization you will need to be cleared about what kind of candidates you wish to hire because you will release advertisements and you will start the recruitment process on the basis of the job descriptions and the profiles that you create therefore the job descriptions and the profiles must be as accurate as possible encouraging uh, diversity in the workforce including women backward communities and uh, individuals with uh, special abilities is important and it may also be a legal requirement so manpower requirements may need to be redefined accordingly so estimating manpower requirements simply means deciding what kind of manpower you need to implement your plans or strategies and make them into a reality recruitment is the second step in the staffing process recruitment is the process of searching for prospective employees and encouraging them to apply for the jobs in your organization which means that you need to communicate clearly about the jobs in your organization to the correct pool of candidates job descriptions and candidate profiles are used to create job advertisements for example you just can't put out an advertisement stating 10 workers wanted or 3 managers wanted the job description is what explains to the public about what you are looking for job ads can be displayed at the workplace published in print media or shared through electronic media choosing the right kind of platform is very essential if you are looking for internal candidates just send an email to all your employees if you want to hire freshers you may need to use platforms like instagram if you are looking for very experienced professionals you may need to use linkedin now the goal of recruitment is to locate potential candidates and create a pool of prospective job applicants if you have not written proper job descriptions or you have not advertised on the correct platforms you may get a lot of applicants but they may not be the kind of people that you are actually looking for and both internal that is within the organization and external which is outside the organization sources can be used to create the pool of applicants from which you can make your selections and a point to consider here is that internal sources are usually limited 
because you can just transfer or promote current employees. While external sources are used for fresh talent and it will also give you a wider selection of candidates. Selection is the third step in the staffing process. Selection is the process of choosing the best candidates from the pool of prospective job applicants which has been developed during the recruitment process. For highly specialized jobs, a rigorous selection process ensures that the organization gets the best candidates and it also boosts the self-esteem of those who are selected by giving them a sense of achievement. And a rigorous selection process is very important to ensure that the right candidates are selected for the job. The selection process typically includes various assessments or tests such as the intelligence tests, aptitude tests, personality tests, trade tests and it will also include interviews. At the end of the selection process, successful candidates are offered an employment contract which outlines the terms, the conditions and the date of joining. Placement and orientation is the fourth step in the staffing process. Placement involves assigning the employee to the specific job or the position that they were selected for. Orientation is the process of introducing the new employee to the company and to the team, including their superiors, the subordinates and the colleagues. The employee is familiarized with the workplace, the company rules and policies. And uh, as the old saying goes, the first impression is the best impression. And the first impression for the employee about the workplace happens during the orientation. So this process of socialization is crucial as it can significantly impact the employee's decision to stay with the company and it will also affect their subsequent job performance. Training and development is the fifth step in the staffing process. Normally, employees don't just seek a job, they seek a career because nobody wants to keep doing the same thing forever. So, employees will seek opportunities for growth and advancement. This will require learning and development. Organizations facilitate employee learning through in-house training centers or through partnerships with training and educational institutions. Continuous learning benefits both employees and the organizations by enhancing employee motivation, strengthening competencies and improving performance. Offering career advancement opportunities helps organizations in attracting and retaining talented employees. In larger organizations, a dedicated human resource department typically handles staffing and the training and development functions. Whereas in smaller organizations, the line managers may handle all the management functions including training and development. Later in this chapter, we will discuss training and development in more detail. Performance appraisal is the sixth step in the staffing process. Performance appraisal involves evaluating the employee's current or past performance against predetermined standards. These standards can be called targets or they can be key performance indicators or KPIs. All organizations, whether formally or informally, appraise employee performance. The process includes defining job expectations, assessing performance against expectations and providing feedback to the employee. For the performance appraisal process to work, employees should be aware of the standards that they are being evaluated against and supervisors are responsible for giving constructive feedback. Promotion and career planning is the seventh step in the staffing process. As I have mentioned earlier, no employee wants to keep doing the same job always. Employees want opportunities to learn new things, to get more responsibilities, to get promoted and of course to earn more. Employees don't just want a job, they want a career. So organizations must address career related issues and provide promotion or growth opportunities for their employees. Managers should design activities that support employees long term interests and encourage them to reach their full potential. Promotions are a key aspect of career growth involving increased responsibility, higher pay and greater job satisfaction. Compensation is the eighth step in the staffing process. Remember, in business studies, the meaning of the word compensation means the remuneration, the salary, the bonus 
and any other benefits that an employee receives in exchange for the work done. In many companies, the salary structure of an employee may be called the comp structure or the compensation structure. Organizations need to establish wage and salary plans based on the worth of the job. Compensation includes both the direct financial payments such as wages, salaries, incentives, commissions, bonuses and also indirect payments such as insurance, vacations, etc. Direct financial payments can be time-based, daily, weekly, monthly, annually or they can be performance-based, based on the number of units produced. Compensation plans can combine time-based pay with performance-based incentives so that the employee gets a fixed pay for standard productivity and gets additional pay at a higher rate for higher productivity with quality. Something like uh, Frederick Taylor's piece rate wage system that we discussed in a previous video. Factors which influence pay plans include legal requirements, union policies, company policies and also market conditions. The next topic in the NCRT textbook is aspects of staffing. And here the three aspects of staffing that are being discussed are recruitment, selection and training and development. You will see that these three aspects are already covered in the steps of the staffing process. Recruitment is the second step, selection is the third step and training and development is the fifth step. So why are they being discussed here again? And what about the other steps like estimating manpower requirements, placement and orientation, performance appraisal, promotion and career planning and compensation? Well, in reality, all of the steps of the staffing process are nothing but the aspects of the staffing process. But these three aspects are the steps which have more sub-steps or sub-processes. So they are being discussed separately in more detail. If you use the points from the aspects of staffing in a question about the steps in staffing or if you use points from the steps of staffing while writing about aspects, you will still be correct and you will get marks. Recruitment includes identification and attraction of the best candidates. Selection includes the assessment, evaluation and final matching to the job requirements. And uh, training and development includes ensuring that uh, the employee has the required skills and knowledge. So when we look at these three aspects of uh, staffing, we are just studying these three steps in more detail. Recruitment is the second step in the staffing process and it is one of the three steps or aspects that is being discussed in more detail because it has several sub-steps or sub-processes. Recruitment is the process of searching for possible candidates for a job or for a role or for a function. It involves stimulating or encouraging prospective employees or prospective candidates to apply for the jobs in the organization. Advertising is one of the modes of communicating job openings to potential candidates. First of all, there are two main sources of recruitment. Sources are the modes or the channels through which you will get your candidates. You can get candidates internally from within the organization or you can get candidates externally from outside the organization. Internal sources means that you are looking at your current employees. You can either transfer employees from current teams into the new team or you can promote an existing employee into the next level role in the new team. External sources means that you do not have any candidates currently within your organization. So you can get external candidates. And external sources can be like a direct recruitment where the recruitment team directly reaches out to the candidates. You can use internet portals like Nokri.com or LinkedIn. Or it can be casual callers that is candidates who have sent in their resume or just walked in for a recruitment drive. It can be through advertisements which can be on platforms like LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram or it can be an advertisement in a newspaper. You can use employment exchanges like in some states where some jobs have to be registered with the government employment exchanges who will send in candidates who have registered with them. And typically this is for entry level jobs. You can make use of agencies or consultants like recruitment agencies or placement consultants who are also called headhunters. You can make use of campus recruitment, which is typically a good source for bulk hiring or mass hiring for junior level roles. 
you can make use of uh, employee referrals where uh, employees refer their ex colleagues from previous organizations or uh, refer their friends or relatives you can also make use of labor contractors who will provide short term or long term contract workers next what are the activities within the recruitment process well they include identification of the different sources of personnel that is which of these internal or external sources best fits the current requirements assessment of the validity of the sources that is testing the applications that are coming in from the different sources and identifying which one is yielding the best candidates choosing the most suitable sources for example direct recruitment may be the cheapest but it requires the recruitment team to spend more time and effort in sourcing candidates agencies and consultants are very effective especially for senior level hiring since uh, they can also reach out to those candidates who are not actively looking for jobs but consultants charge a hefty fee so depending on the type of requirement and the urgency the most suitable source needs to be chosen and finally inviting applications from the prospective candidates to build a pool which can then be screened and assessed to start selecting the best candidates for further testing interviews etc in short recruitment is the process of tapping into the best sources and building a pool of the best candidates for the role next let us look at the merits and limitations of internal and external sources as discussed previously internal sources can be transfers or promotions or there are several external sources for getting external or outside candidates now what are the merits or the advantages and the limitations or the disadvantages of internal and external sources let us start with the advantages of internal recruitment it is simpler and cheaper because the candidates are already inside the organization employees are motivated by the opportunities for career growth through promotions and also for learning new skills in the new roles transfers can help in balancing the existing workforce and also because the candidates are already inside your organization it also means faster deployment of personnel if required there is also better evaluation of candidates because uh, their previous work history and current work performance can be reviewed easily coming to the disadvantages of uh, internal sources they are that they can reduce the introduction of new blood into the organization which limits new ideas and approaches and employees with guaranteed time bound promotions may not be proactive or productive like it happens in government organizations where promotions are mostly guaranteed after a certain number of years of service and the spirit of competition between employees is hampered or lost due to guaranteed promotions because if promotion is guaranteed why should an employee try to prove himself or herself and the frequent transfers especially if it happens across different locations leads to disruptions in the employee's personal life resulting in dissatisfaction next what are the advantages of external sources of candidates for a new type of roles or for specialist jobs you can source qualified personnel that is you can attract qualified and trained candidates from other organizations you have a wider choice with a larger pool of applicants you can access fresh talent that is you can introduce new talent when internal options are not sufficient and it also brings in a competitive spirit because the fact that senior level roles can be filled by external candidates encourages current staff to perform better so that they can prove themselves to be ready for the next level roles coming to the disadvantages external hiring can cause dissatisfaction it may frustrate existing employees by reducing promotion chances and uh, external hiring can be a lengthy process because uh, notifying vacancies gathering applications and starting selection takes a lot of time it can be a costly process because uh, external recruitment involves high costs due to advertising agency or consultant fees and having to screen a large number of uh, applications and uh, finally training and induction of external recruits takes time leading to loss of productivity so the organization the recruitment team and the managers should choose between internal and external sources 
after considering all the advantages and the disadvantages. Next, let us look at selection. The selection process identifies and chooses the best candidates from among the pool of applicants. Candidates may undergo multiple tests and interviews with many being eliminated at each stage. Selection is a continuous process. It begins with application screening and may continue even after a candidate has joined the organization. It is a judgment based because it involves assessing the candidate's performance potential. That is, the candidate is being selected on the basis of how the candidate may perform in the future. And the effectiveness of the selection process is tested or validated by the on-the-job performance of the selected candidate. The actual process of selection can be divided into eight steps. It starts with preliminary screening and the shortlisted candidates may need to take some selection tests such as the intelligence test, aptitude, personality, trade or interest tests. And uh, then there may be an employment interview. In some jobs, references and background is also checked. And then the selection decision is made. And uh, for some jobs, medical examination may also be mandatory to ensure that the candidate is physically fit. And then the job offer is rolled out. When the candidate accepts the job offer, it becomes a contract of employment. So selection is a very important and a lengthy aspect of the staffing process. The next topic is about education, training and development. What is the difference between these three terms? Education focuses on acquiring broad knowledge and on theories and concepts, often in a formal setting like schools or colleges or universities. And the objective of education is to prepare the students or the individuals for future roles and future responsibilities. Training aims at enhancing specific skills or specific competencies that are needed for current job tasks. It is practical and job focused and it is often provided through short term courses or through on the job sessions. Development involves long term growth and career advancement of the employee. It focuses on overall personal and professional growth. It includes broader skill enhancement and also prepares individuals for future challenges and higher roles by giving them various opportunities. In this chapter, we will discuss more about training and development. Organizations have both trainings and development programs. Training and development together aim to improve employee performance by enhancing skills, enhancing knowledge and changing attitudes through learning. Training focuses on the knowledge and skills required for the current job, whereas development focuses on providing the knowledge, the skills and the experience and the opportunities to prepare employees for future roles. Now, what is the importance of training and development? Well, as jobs have become more complex, Due to rapid technological and societal changes, the need for employees to continuously upgrade their skills has also increased. And training and development helps both the personal and the organization. How does training and development benefit the organization? Through efficient learning, because training programs can reduce wastage of time and resources by the employees. It leads to higher productivity by improving work quality and leading to higher profits. It can help with the leadership preparation because future managers are created through training and development. And also such programs boost employee morale, lowering absenteeism and leading to a reduction in employee turnover or attrition. And training and development programs make the organization more adaptable by helping employees in responding to changes. And uh, how does training and development benefit the employee? It can lead to better performance by increasing efficiency in the current job. It can help with uh, skill growth, which uh, enhances future career prospects. It can lead to higher pay because better performance leads to more earnings. And uh, training programs can improve safety by educating the employee and reducing accident risks. And it can also lead to job satisfaction by increasing overall employee morale. This is a table comparing some of the important aspects of training and development. 
the focus of training is on enhancing specific skills for current tasks the focus of development is overall growth and future potential the objective of training is to improve immediate job performance and the objective of development is to prepare employees for future roles and future responsibilities training is typically short term development happens over a longer term the scope of training is narrow and it is limited to specific job related skills whereas the scope of development is broad and it can include leadership and personal growth the target audience for trainings can be all employees especially new hires and those in specific roles whereas the target audience for development programs can be all employees but there will be additional focus on those employees who show some leadership potential and finally trainings are job specific and task oriented whereas development programs are holistic and career oriented the next topic is training methods training can be given to employees through on the job methods or off the job methods on the job training takes place at the workplace where the employee is actively engaged in their job employees or the trainees learn by doing typically under the supervision of a trainer or a senior or through direct participation in work tasks the costs of on the job training are generally lower as uh, they typically do not need any additional facilities or resources the outcome of on the job training is immediate application of skills in a real work environment off the job training is conducted away from the workplace it is often conducted in a separate training facility or in educational institutions trainees learn theoretical knowledge they learn broader skills and concepts which may not be immediately used at the workplace the costs of uh, of the job trainings are often higher due to external facilities materials and trainers off the job trainings provide a distraction free environment for learning and often cover a wider range of topics as compared to on the job training apprenticeship programs coaching internship training job rotation are examples of on the job training classroom lectures and conferences workshops audio visuals like uh, films case studies computer modeling vestibule training and uh, programmed instructions are examples of off the job training let us first cover some of the important types of on the job training methods in uh, apprenticeship programs trainees work under a skilled master to acquire higher level skills often required for trades like plumbing or electrical work where on the job training is absolutely essential in coaching a senior manager guides the trainees by setting goals reviewing progress and by preparing the trainees for higher responsibilities in uh, internship training a joint program may be organized between educational institutions and businesses combining academic studies with practical work experience with the job rotation trainees are shifted between the different departments of the organization to gain a broader understanding of the entire organization and its different functions next let us look at some of the important modes of off the job trainings off the job trainings are those trainings which are not conducted at the workplace they are conducted elsewhere classroom lectures and conferences mean formal presentations are done using audio visual aids to convey information rules or procedures audio visuals or films can also be used for off the job trainings and they can be used to demonstrate various skills and to convey information and these are often paired with discussions for better understanding in the case study method trainees analyze real life business problems they develop solutions and implement them computer modeling simulates work environments for learning without real life risks or costs vestibule training means training on actual equipment away from the work floor and this method is often used for handling sophisticated machinery and finally programmed instruction means structured learning in sequential units progressing from simple to complex with interactive elements like uh, questions or tests or quizzes and uh, with that we have come to the end of this chapter if you have any questions or feedback post a comment below 
I will see you very soon in the next video where we will cover the next chapter. Take care and Jai Hind.